To many, math can be obsolete and irrelevant in day-to-day -day life. To A.J. Maestas, the contrary is true. In his mind, probability lies in every step you take as a consumer. From buying a hot dog at a ball game because you happen to be seeking shade, to staying at the blackjack table all night due to its location. The reasoning can all be traced back to Navigate, a data insight company AJ founded 15 years ago. We take a deep dive into the mind of a business mathematician and just how numerical our behavior really is. Tonight on Chasing Capitalism. Oh, it's like this looks oh, like the really uh, Oval Office. That <laughs> it is. I mean, look at the carpet. <laughs> okay, so AJ Maestas. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right, Maestas? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. it's Hispanic, so Maestas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, founder and CEO of Navigate. Yep. Um, consulting, marketing, mm -hmm. not limited to sports, but I'm sure you enjoy. Ninety percent sports. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ten percent entertainment. <laughs> so. so, how'd you get here? Give it. Give us the backstory. I would say um, there's a lot of luck, right? That's always true in these situations. Um, but I did make a conscious effort to marry my vocation together with my avocation. So the things that differentiated me in my career, sort of quant analytics sort of oriented skills, was a void in sport and entertainment. Uh, when I was getting my MBA, I was able to discover this. And then working for what are now competitors, I was able to further learn. And um, so, yeah, I would say being willing to you know sort of chase something you're passionate about being lucky enough that that field that industry had a big gap or a void in that and then you know <laughs> the rest is just good people so you say you found a void what void was that specifically in the sports marketing industry uh, right when i was coming out of business school 2005 every panel every uh, uh conference you know had breakouts on measuring marketing okay uh, so things like uh and this is sports marketing of course so understanding, you know, are more people likely to buy that because they sponsor the NFL or the Super Bowl, things along those lines. And sure. the answers were really poor. You'd hear people say things like minutes and seconds of that sign being seen on TV is an ad equivalent and therefore ROI, which that's not actually ROI. ROI is selling stuff, right? Right. And, and bottom line profit relative to the cost of the investment. So uh, it was really quick, uh, uh, quickly apparent that some of the things I was strong in, some of these quantitative measures and you know analytic type thinking was a void in the sports marketing world. So um, kind of like Moneyball, you know that movie uh, Moneyball? It's Brad Pitt, yeah. it's a great movie. Yeah, and do you remember yeah. that scene where they're sitting around and you know the scout's saying you know his girlfriend's not attractive, he lacks confidence, you know they're all kind of going right. from gut feel. Uh, there was a real parallel to that on the business side as well. I mean from branding a team to selling tickets to pricing, you know the naming rights of a stadium, it was all just sort of gut instinct and so that was the void basically is that wow this is a mature industry with a great weakness and what happens to be my personal strength <laughs> so you talk a lot about quantitative data which is true you know yeah. how many beers are bought per game how many yeah. hot dogs are they selling why are they selling the hot dogs where are they selling the hot dogs in the yeah. stadium but a lot of it has to do with psychology right and dealing no with the consumer's wants. So you're able to transform qualitative data to quantitative probability and then sell that to increase companies' return on investment is basically what we're getting at. Yeah, I'd argue you can measure anything. And this is one of the things you'll you'll hear these telltale signs. You know, someone will say something, especially in the world of sports and marketing, like, you know, you know, that's psychology, you can't measure it. You, you can. So half the people at Navigate are social scientists. You okay. know, uh, our recently retired head of research for over 10 years, PhD in experimental psychology from Brown. Uh, he'd been doing this stuff for 30 years, uh, born in, in Brazil, but uh, raised in Germany. He's half German, half Chinese American. And, um, you know, he spent a lifetime on the social sciences side quantifying and measuring, not qualifying. You know, it's not, qua uh, it's, it is actual quantitative measures, right? And understanding uh -huh. how much more uh, likely is someone to be a fan of a team or to pay that price for a ticket or what have you. So the marriage of the quant world, data and analytics, which is our other half of our people, and the social sciences, as I'm describing with this uh, head of research, is a field called behavioral economics. And okay. um, most of what we do as people, most of what you buy, most of the reasons you have certain brands, most of the reasons you quickly judge one thing this way or that way, it, it really is feelings 
Yeah. <laughs> And then we rationalize it with, you know, sort of Math. justification. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So that is, uh, that behavioral economics world is where we live. Half social sciences, half quant and data analytics. Yeah, nerdy stuff. Um, You're but quite the middleman, though. Yeah, 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 exactly. We get to, the, what's not nerdy is what we get to work on and who we get to work with. Mm -hmm. And the massive deals and investments and things that we get to impact. And how many major sports uh, networks are you with? You're with the NFL? Yeah, and yeah. HL, are you MLB at all? All the league I offices. I saw Kansas City. Yeah, we Is just Kansas started City working just with the on? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's it's, great. You know, they have a lot of exciting things going on. Their uh -huh. new ownership group, um, their stadium's getting a little dated. They're going to need to ask themselves what they do with their stadium in a few right. years here. Um, but uh, yeah, all the league offices uh, that you think of, all the major networks and broadcasters, 13 of the top 15 agencies use us or work with us some of the time, about 40 brands. Um, so we're in a really cool place where we get to work with uh, the intermediaries, right, in the agencies and in the buyers and sellers, you know, of advertising. Or, so I'll give you some examples to make it more interesting to anyone please, paying please, attention please. to this. Yeah, like three NFL teams relocated in the last few years. We worked on that for the NFL League office. The NHL expanded to uh, Las Vegas and Seattle. We worked with the nice. commissioner's office on choosing right. those cities. But then we sometimes go on and get to work with those teams. So in the case of Seattle, you know, the company that's building the new arena and the new team hired us to help as well. So fun transformational moments like that, like the Big 12 adding a championship game. We're working on MLB strategy stuff now at the league office. Uh, uh, the National Rugby League in Australia's television deal and some of the teams sort of consolidating. They had too many teams in one city. So uh, as I describe behavioral economics, your eyes might glaze over and it might seem pretty boring. But the cool part is, is every day we're working on some new exciting project related to a transformational moment for a sports team or a league, you know, or even an athlete. Well, and a lot of young kids might want to get into something new because they don't necessarily know how to become a founder and CEO mm -hmm. of, what, 15 years now? Yeah. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's correct. Back yeah. in 2005 or six. Yeah. A lot of people don't have that mindset and they say, well, I'm still passionate about sports. How can I get tied in with these cool people in leagues? Mm -hmm. Well, you kind of just gave them an in. Well, yeah, and I mean, no matter what, first of all, I think it would be amazing if people hear this or just on their own come to a place where, oh, I would like to do something like that. Finding something you do <laughs> that you love for a living is, I mean, it's the ultimate gift. We've all heard that saying, right? You'll right. never work another day the rest of your life if you love what you do for a living. But, um, but then you have to also find your place as the, you fit into that, right? What is the way that you can contribute? You know, how do you add value? The combination of those two is really special, right? If you have a skill, right, that applies and helps, as I did in, you know, this void that we're describing in sports, and you actually love the job, then it's easy. You know, it doesn't feel taxing, you know, that you have to maintain those relationships sure. or learn about that subject matter. I would guide any young person to not have the dream of being a CEO. To what outcome is that? You know, to what end are you chasing? CEO is not a goal, that's an outcome. <laughs> yeah. And the outcome would be from finding something you love to do that you're really good at and then refining and reinvesting in that skill. And how did you come to find that? Because your first gig was an analyst at Microsoft. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah you do your homework. I love it. Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah, and uh, that was a, you know what, what a lesson, right? I got really good grades in school. I went to the University of Washington, Seattle, go Huskies, and um, studied hard, and I thought, well, I should get a good paying job. Microsoft in the 90s was like Google today. You sure. Know, they had tens of thousands of open jobs they couldn't fill because they couldn't find people of the quality that could clear the bar. So it was a real honor to get hired there. All my interviews were like bulge bracket, investment banks, uh, strategy consulting firms. I badly wanted to work at those places and I either got dinged, you know, I didn't get the job, or Microsoft ended up trumping it in that everyone I interviewed with said, I was at Goldman, I, you know, I was at Bain or BCG and McKinsey and all I did was miss out on three or four years of vesting equity here. You know, people were getting rich on equity right. back then. All I missed out is the chance to be at a place where I actually do something as opposed to consult on something. So I got tricked or sold or however you want to say it. And uh, yeah, I bought in. I was like, great, I'm just going to skip that step and go to an amazing company that people would wish they were at. Of course, you know, that was a time the business kind of flatlined. But more importantly, I just wasn't a fit for it. I got to see all these people that were crazy passionate about what they're doing, working days and nights, you know, to change the world with whatever the next great app is going to be. And uh, that didn't mean anything to me. You know, there was no heart in it at all. Yeah, I got fired. <laughs> and you will get fired if you are like me. Uh, entrepreneurs tend to be, you know, disruptors and, you know, uh, indignant about doing things they don't agree with, which well, I, I mean, was. Jobs would cuss about everybody out. He's on the yeah. office. Yeah, yeah, I don't, uh, I've never like, you know, motherfucked anybody, right? Right, so right. I don't scream and yell at people at work, but there's no doubt that I was being difficult at work because I didn't agree with what I was working on or that it was valuable. And I also wasn't passionate about it and uh, kind of poor, poor, my poor boss, I almost forced her to fire me. Um, but 
The point was I took a job because I thought, oh, it pays really well. I thought, oh, that's the place to be. You, know, you want was, a job security. Sure. Or, come, or it you, sounded good to work at Microsoft. Or that was a prestigious place to work that had nothing to do with me actually being good at or liking right. it or wanting to be there myself. Right. Those are things you learn over time. Well, as a young kid, you, you seek security, right? You're, you go out into the world, a lot of people are in debt after school, mm. and y you want something that you know is a given. And most sure. of the time, the given isn't that appealing. I, I'd, I'd go even further, and I'd argue, because I'm guessing most of your listeners are you know, somewhere near your age, you're still often playing out the patterns of your parents at your age. You know, one of the really cool exercises to go through and really understanding who you are, one would be taking objective assessments. Maybe this is because I'm a researcher, but there's a bunch like Myers-Briggs that are free and cheap on the internet in which you can, if you take it in an unbiased way, you can really learn about yourself and what you are an actual fit for. Um, but keeping your eye on, am I doing this for me or my parents? Um, this is a cheesy exercise, so don't laugh, but for your listeners, if they would take just a second to think about the parent they most uh, seek love from and have a challenge in receiving that love from. Mm -hmm. You could even do it yourself. Any chance it's your father? I'm just too lucky. I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. you yeah. know, I, I'm very fortunate to have a very good relationship with both of my parents. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Um, I look a lot of people, unfortunately, are not in that case, though, and uh, a lot of my friends, too. So. Yeah. Well, I just, and I only say that just guessing, you know, looking around at the office and all these amazing things that, sure. uh, you know, uh, your father's obviously done in his life. Sure. The, uh, there's a parent you're trying to impress or trying to receive love from quite often, and you... You, you will do anything to receive that love. You're just a child. You know, you've been dependent on them most of your life. The point to get to, uh, to the crux of this for your listeners would be, if you could take a moment and ask yourself, you know, is there a parent I'm seeking love from? And what did I have to do to be worthy of that love? That second question is really important. Quite often, the kind of person who's listening to a podcast to better themselves, I'm guessing they're super high achievers. I'm guessing what they had to do to be worthy of their parents' love was to be exceptional. You know, break standards, get all A's, you know, be valedictorian. When you can finally figure out if you're living for yourself or your parent is a breakthrough moment, <laughs> you know? Um, you get to live your life, not theirs, and it's so, they don't mean to do this, right? They don't mean to, they want a better life for you, and so they take in their mind what they view as the better life path, the, the life they wish they could have led, and they push you, nudge you, even like, you know, demand that you go in that direction. I so played I, soccer, <laughs> yeah. I played Little League, I know, yeah. I know. All those parents in the stands, you, you yeah. see when they're like yelling like it's, it's so the World sad. Series. It's so sad. It's sad because it's about them and it embarrasses me because it's a child and you're, what I wish is there was just unconditional love for these kids so they could actually figure out the path that is meant for them. And to wrap this back into how I got into this rabbit hole and where we took this little divergence in our conversation, um, to have the chance to live a life for yourself when you go to a really prestigious sounding job that is like I did, that is uh, not a fit with your passion, not an actual interest because it's where you're supposed to go or it's because I was a good student, I earned my way to go here. Um, you're not living for yourself <laughs> and you are just that much further away from your ultimate calling. Boy, do I feel lucky that I'm pretty sure I found my ultimate calling and uh, <laughs> um, I clearly didn't know when I was 18 or 22. <laughs> did you have a breaking point? Uh, Where do you realize that? Um, can you just, I just noticed the wire, can you just uh, like, the wire hanging on your lap, can you just like move it up off to the side? Yeah, yeah. I'm stuck it under, yeah. There I didn't go. realize our lap was visible. Yeah, yeah, you're good, don't worry about Too it. Too bad. <laughs> Legs are not going to look good. Like that. <laughs> really, it's like should have hit the tanning bed. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, just more of like you know looking inappropriate. But oh, you're fine. Um, I'm sorry you asked. Um, did you have a breaking point at all during your time at Microsoft or after when you realized I want to create my own asset? No, I wasn't thinking. You know, you're ahead of your time. You know what I mean? And even asking that and thinking of that for yourself. Getting fired was my like you know wake up call. Even if I kind of forced them to do it by being such a pain in the ass. Sure. But but you know um, those moments are gifts. Mo most people view a moment like that, like a breakup or you know a loved one passing away or you know a divorce or you know getting fired. You view those as crushing moments. But you know what's amazing is I ask the fun questions right during business dinners. I, I we host our clients quite often. You know what I mean to get to know them better. Sure. And uh, one of the questions is tell us about the greatest achievement of your life or you know sort of what you're most proud of. The, they're not prompted to say this, but they almost always start the story with their, their greatest setback. You know, they say, I was, I, before I founded this business, I was let go because they didn't like my idea at Boeing, and I went and created, you know, competitive, you know, aerospace engineering company. It's the weirdest thing that uh, if we had the ability in the moment, what feels like pain is really a lesson you're, <laughs> you're supposed to be receiving, and it is telling you you're in the wrong place. So getting fired at Microsoft was embarrassing. I lied about it to friends. I tried to kind of like hide it, you know, to make it look like, you know, well, I was really leaving anyway. 
but the truth was is it was an awesome powerful piece of feedback saying that's not what you're supposed to do and sometimes that's just as good as knowing what you are supposed to do right i mean we're all doing this trial and error game as far as like building assets and creating wealth th that again was not an objective it was an outcome uh, i'm stealing a line from a client of ours gatorade and pepsi okay. uh, they say profit is an outcome not an objective mm -hmm. their, their intent is to with gatorade hydrate athletes you know allow for excellent performance etc cetera, etc cetera. just happens to be if they're really good at it they own over 70 percent market share which they do and they make a bunch of money which they do so um i really wasn't thinking about wealth creation when i started navigate I was thinking, how do I find something I love to do how do I, that I'm also good at that contributes to the world that the world might need? And then, wow, the idea that I get to work in an industry I love that I was just hoping to get a job in, and then now you know, I have total control of my schedule and my life. I work with amazing people. Yeah, those are all outcomes. And you're, you're surrounding yourself with the right people too. God, I, sure. I talk to you and I hear Frank. Oh yeah, I Fra really hear Frank. Frank Sauls. Yeah, yeah, he's something else, man. He is. He's well the reason. And he's the passionate. reason I was able to do this. Oh you know? no kidding. Yeah, he organized all the branding. Oh, I'm really so cool happy to, to hear that. To. And he he he's obviously special. set us us up too. I went hiking with him yesterday morning. You know, he you talk to Frank and you learn something. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> kind of like a genie. Like a genie. For those who are listening, he has an agency uh, named uh, uh, Heart Hook and. Uh, it's the best creative experience I've ever been through in my life. You know, we get to work with, I told you, 13 of the top 15 sports agencies, you know, in the world. Mm -hmm. I have never seen a creative process. You know, we've worked on 12 NFL League sponsors. You know, those are the people doing those big, expensive, cool Super Bowl ads. Uh, I could give you a, m a million other examples of things we've worked on where you're seeing people being paid a lot of money to come up with cool, creative solutions and commercials. Never been through a process like Frank's. It's the best. It's insane. I mean, you sit down with the guy, and at first you're like, where is this going to go? Yeah. But then he brings out the whiteboard on the glass, and he yeah. goes, dude, dude, you got to listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then you sit back, and it kind of takes it away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's been to hit this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he's great. He's I mean, passionate. He's, he's really he's great. good at what he does. I don't think a lot of people take enough time to do that, is sit down and examine not only their company's brand, but their brand. Mm -hmm. What do you want to stand for? He, he put me through this great exercise where it was, what are your four top qualities? What do you want your brand to stand for? Mm -hmm. Which I'm not going to say on camera because I probably shouldn't. But, um, you know, it, it's interesting to have a day to just sit back and examine. And it didn't come to me until a week after. After you really think about it and then think, okay, well, maybe this is kind of the direction I want to go. Um, and I, I think that's important as a business owner and an ind individual as well. Because it kind of explores your ideologies. What do you want to stand for? What do you want your company to stand for? Mm -hmm. What do you want people to think when they look at you or your company? How do you want to come off? Yeah, I, I, I would recommend anybody trying to replicate that exercise because it's really frustrating, right? But when you're frustrated, it means you're about to have a breakthrough. Oh, and, and it does. It, and it is so damn hard. I'll tell you ours, I mean, extraordinary, ingenious, contagious, you know, like, like we live and breathe and try to, you know, even share those words with the outside world like our clients to make sure that you know we're moving towards our North Star. What a cool process, right? It is. Yeah. It really aligns you with what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that as an owner, CEO, or leader, because that's what you are, you lead the company, is you align with the vision of the company. You mm -hmm. know, A lot of people can go in and they might have a very strong sense of business understanding and finance and able to boost up the balance sheet performance, but they don't understand how to align with the relationship between the company the consumer and also the team and mm -hmm. that's what really matters at the end of the day because you can hire people to take care of the rest yeah well uh, n no billionaire does it himself I, th I think there's a horrible confusion that like hard work and you definitely have to work hard to build that skill and to get to a certain place but I mean do you think that Jeff Bezos works uh, you know 100 billion times harder than a, a, a someone who's just a billionaire right of course he doesn't it's physically impossible to do so so it is about leadership it's about vision and motivating and attracting and retaining talent. Well, and what a lot of people don't realize is the rich don't become richer by working harder. They exactly. become rich by working less. And what I mean by that isn't that they start working a nine to five and working for somebody and doing it less and less and less and then somehow attaining more wealth. Of course, you do need an initial foundation of cash to get going, but after that, you know, your assets appreciate other assets and then it's kind of a sense of compounding as to what comes after that. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. They think that they can become rich, or wealthy I should say, by working for money more and more and more and harder and harder and harder, mm -hmm. instead of having their money work while they sleep, while they shower, while they eat, mm -hmm. while they go out on the weekends. So I, I think a lot of people get caught up in, if I work harder, 
then I can earn more money, and then eventually I'll be able to kick back. Well, by the time you kick back, you're 60 or 70. And what was the point? I agree. Uh, while we're doling out advice, because I'm just thinking of the age of your listeners and what place they are in life, it is not the destination. Uh, there's an incredible field that's about 20, pl just slightly over 20 years old, of positive psychology, which is such a beautiful thing in learning what does make us happy, how do we install practices in our life that make us more happy. And those that say, when this, when I retire, then I'll do the hobbies I want, or then I'll be happy, then I'll travel, it doesn't work, no matter what it is. Even if it's the promotion, or the car, or the house that you want, whatever it is, it, it, it's, a, it's a mean reverting thing to say that you go back to that level of happiness. So you get to choose to be happy right now, here today, every day. <laughs> um, or you get to hope that someday this thing, even the wealth doesn't provide that for you, by the way. Or materialism, you know, yeah, yeah. it happens to me, it happens to everybody. You get something new, you like it for five minutes, and then you want something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very unfulfilling. Uh, what, what, what would you do with the wealth? Most people don't need it anyway. The things that they really want in life, sense of community, purpose, contribution, you right. know, health and wellness, etc. it's all available to you for almost free. The biggest thing for me is just people. You know, mm. being able to talk to people like this and learn. Oh yeah, that's good. Knowledge and people is great. I, I think it's so good you're doing this. Uh, you have to learn some lessons many, many times, but if you ask a lot of questions, you're reading uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People right now, right? Dale Carnegie's book. It's, it's sort of like the 101 of sales. But the truth is is that uh, you, do, you do learn when you're listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that becomes your knowledge. Well, well and also, I, I said this in a previous episode, but also knowledge is only potential power. Experience mm -hmm. is what makes you really learn. Sometimes you have to get fired from Microsoft to get the wheels going on Navigate. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Or the next job. I got fired from that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> Happy to. Happy to. It's unbelievable. Um, the gift, to go back to something we were talking about earlier, the silver lining that you can't see in the moment. You know, like you're experiencing tragedy or a setback, and it's actually a gift. You know, and it's just a, a lesson, a communication. Uh, you know, where you are supposed to go with your energy, right? Pivot. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to beat your head against the ball. Right. And also starting a company too. I mean, there's so how many roadblocks did you face with Navigate? I, it blows my mind that regular. It's the privilege of being who we are in this country, right? Like. It, it blows my mind the things you have to register for to be, you know, on point legally. You know, I mean, from a tax perspective, like. It just blows my mind. You know, I understand. I understood within minutes, honestly, how why people start a business and just earn money under the table until it becomes significant. I used to, you know, really, really look down on anyone who's like, you know, skirting taxes or rules in entrepreneurship. But I mean, the bureaucracy—it's crazy. And then there's the risk. You know, you, you're going to make zero in the beginning, and it could be zero for a very long time. I mean, who can do that? You know. Um, there's very few countries in the world and places in the world and then you have to be born into privilege even inside of that first world to have the backing, right? right. To have the runway. My wife's very successful. Um, it took an enormous amount of pressure off on starting a business. Imagine if you're carrying a mortgage, had children, and we're going to take your income to zero on the hopes that it would someday be equal right. or more later. I right. mean, that's a pretty crazy Those are the best kind of stories <laughs> though. And it, <laughs> yeah. it's a small percentage that make it, but for the yeah. ones that do, it's very impressive. Yeah. Well, a lot of really capable people who could make it don't because they don't have the guts. Or they're too smart, you know, they see all the pitfalls because right. the odds are you will fail. How many people sign up for things where you're more likely to fail than not? Right. <laughs> Doesn't sound smart, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, in, that, in that same sense, it's like going into something realizing what is about to happen. You know, I'm, a, I'm about to pay my life savings to fund this little company. Yeah. What's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is yeah. there a patent I don't know about that's mm. going to shut this whole operation down yeah. and then I'm back at square one? Happens all the time. That's the biggest thing. I think it's important people do that when they're young, when they don't have a wife, when they don't have kids. It's important. That yeah. and traveling and exploring and learning about yourself. There's yeah. only one time in your life to do it. Well, for I most people. 12 weeks a year. For most people. For most people, I said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I get that. I get that. Yeah. And I'm sharing so much detail, only hoping that it's valuable to the no, people no, listening. No, no, it's great. I travel 12 weeks a year. You would not think, you know, that's not something I'd want my clients to know, you know, or I'd want to brag about it. But um, I think that you learn more in traveling and experiencing uh, than you possibly can via any other method. It's unbelievable. It even drives me to read on those subjects. But meeting people, their circumstances, seeing firsthand. Um, most of this is third world country type, you know, travel. Up to this point in my life, I'm 44. I'm sure I'll start to pivot to a safer, more comfortable, you know, ways and places of travel. Right. But, uh, but I totally agree. And I had, uh, when I went to my mentors and people I trusted in starting my business, I was 29. 
about half of them sort of said it's too soon. You know, like, you know, you need, a, you need to take a client from the agency you're working at now. That seems pretty unethical to me, but they basically like, you gotta tee it up so you know you're gonna have a client day one. Otherwise, you're gonna starve. But again, not very ethical, didn't wanna do that. They said, uh, you know, they said, wait, they said, have, you know, do you have a mouse trap that's perfect yet? I was like, no, no, you never do, right? You jump without knowing where you're gonna land. The half that did encourage me said, just as you did, right? No mortgage, low risk, worst case scenario, you'll learn. I did within a number, like two, three months, I knew that I could re-enter the workforce in a better place, that I didn't actually burn bridges or lose people's respect, you actually gain it. Um, so that it was pretty damn riskless. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listen to you, listen to Tim Ferriss. Um, he has a really cool one if you wanna uh, search for it. It's even printed online. It's sort of like this risk reward matrix on travel. Right. And it basically shows what people think the risk is to their career by leaving and traveling the world for a year and what it really is. And that you know you can actually come back in a better place or maybe a new place you were supposed to go because you needed to like break those patterns. So yeah, um, it's pretty darn riskless when you're young, but you you don't know that and you don't think that. Worst case scenario, super steep learning curve. Worst case. And a lot of people don't realize at the end of the day, if your company does fail, if you and your family don't live in the nicest home, mm-hmm. you're only on this earth for seventy, hundred years. Yeah. Ish. You know. Yeah. If and you're lucky. Yeah. And um, I, I think the fact that one day we're all gonna be ashes again is, mm. why not go for it? Why, why waste your life? You Very know? much agree, very much agree. I, I think everybody should wanna rather fail than not try. I agree, I agree. Uh, it's funny, isn't it? That people are so scared, um, and I think they're not seeing the bigger picture. So scared to fail, so scared to look bad, you know. Uh, the, your generation, I hope it's not insulting, but we, we're, we're doing a lot of Gen Z research right now. Um, so today, that would be, you know, age 22, 23 to age 11. Um, there's some disturbing trends, and I blame social media. Leisure time on these devices is past television, especially for that age. But for all U.S. You know, citizens, it's about an hour more than TV. It's disgusting how much between those two scre- screens, we're talking like seven, eight hours a day, even more so, again, for Gen Z looking at others, you know, the Instagram model type concept. Um, first ever time generation, their top two goals are to be rich and famous. Look um, rich and famous. Well, it makes me feel, I'm looking down right now because I feel a little sad. Um, but, but yeah, um, if you're everywhere you look around and the people you hold up, you know, and you know, it's you know, prestigious to be the Kardashians or something along those lines, like that's the life I want to lead. You know, you move toward that goal. You know, it's what you see in your neighborhood, what you see in your society. So, um, yeah, I, w- I do wish people were more comfortable. And a, l- a lot of people are worried about fitting in, especially now. I yeah. mean, the amount of, I'm not going to go that far, but it, it's true. It, it, about wanting to fit the social norm of, you know, what your platform looks like, what your personal brand is, yeah. how you want to talk, how you want to act, who you want to associate with. I mean, people thought Mean Girls was bad. I mean. Yeah, it's awful. Oh, yeah. The way it can go Imagine viral. Imagine if they made a movie about it today. Oh, you know? I mean, uh, rates of suicide, depression, and... Ha- I mean, the, 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 there's a ton of metrics that are really, really bad connected to that. I, I'm not on social media. I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm not really, actually. It's like for a business thing. Well, that's um, how I did my homework. Oh, right? good, good. Yeah. It's, um, so it does pay off, is my it, point. And, and for business networking purposes, you right. know, to stay connected when someone leaves to one job or another. So I, I wish I could have that massive network of connection but in my opinion it is not worth the consequence the negative downside of not being present being on your phone all the time uh this like comparison game people are going into this what you're looking at right here is you know for me what i want to be t-shirt shorts this tooth has been missing for 10 months it's your pirate these are fake up here one of them had to be replaced i lost my teeth growing up in alaska age 16. um it really just doesn't bother me i'm not in a rush to replace it i am getting it replaced but you get the point is that uh like, um, I don't know how to describe it, but, but if you could be free of what brand I'm associated with, how I look in this photo, right. you know, how many friends, who's liking on this thing, God, I've just, it's fantastic. the headspace to like be free of what everybody thinks of you. Right. I wish everyone could be, none of us are perfect, right? But I wish everyone could be further along in that scale and this current generation that we're probably talking to today is the worst in history as far as those metrics. Definitely. Yeah. I don't, I don't have TikTok. I Good think TikTok's you. terrible. <laughs> yeah. All my neighbor kids have it. I, yeah. I see the fun in it, you know? It's fun. Uh, the dancing, I mean, I get, I get it. It's fun. Um, I think 
everyone should just go outside, do a bit of living. Read a book, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I read a book a week, every week or two, you know, like, there's something about long form where there's still value in going deep on a subject. Right. So there's your 15 second version or your 130 character version or whatever you want to, you know, put it in in format wise. And then there's your 12 hours, you know, with a good book. Um, I don't know. We'll see what the future holds. But uh, but deep thinking has led people to greater places. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Anytime I finish a book, I'll find myself for the next week or so until I finish another is or probably more than a week in your case. I'm, mm. I'm a lot more busy in yeah. high school and whatnot. But um, mm. it's I find myself repeating information that I didn't realize I knew. So something will get brought up and then I'll be like, oh, well, yeah, I just read that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It finds you. That good information finds you. It affects who your circle is. You know what I mean? If your circle of friends are, you know, TikTok obsessed and, uh, you know, constantly gossiping. I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt uh, who said um, there, uh, what was it? Small minds talk about other people. Average minds talk about places and events. And great minds talk about concepts. Something like that. I'm, I'm misquoting her. Sure. But uh, Get the point. But there's a whole lot of small mindedness right now. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Mm. I hope it changes. I hope something tips the other Me way. Me too. Me too. Maybe that'll be your next project. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have some friends who are trying to made their money through the tech world, you know, are kind of rich and retired, and they're looking for their ways to tip the scales back in a healthier place, you know. Right. And I think that's big. You know, after, you know, you've had your fair share of Navigate and whatnot, having a way to give back to something you're passionate about, like you talk about this Gen Z issue, mm -hmm. I think is great. Everybody should have one. Because at that point, yes, you worked what your passion was. You created something. But you also need to find another passion and a way to give back. I, I would, I, I'm only saying these things like trying to help your listeners. You know, um, Much like when I get there then, don't do that. I would say giving back is a lifetime commitment. I think it's one of the core pillars of leading a happy and fulfilled life. And contribution could be raising great children if you're a parent. You know, It's different phases of life for different things. But I've been a big brother since 1997. I spend a significant percent of my time doing philanthropic works tied in with my travel, fundraising campaigns for needy and worthy causes. Um, I started as a big brother because I didn't have money. I was a junior in college in Seattle and uh, I knew I should be giving back. I felt I should. I felt like I was unbelievably fortunate to be sitting in the seat I was sitting in but didn't have, well they say time, treasure and talent. Didn't have a lot of talent back then, you know, being whatever I was, 20, you know, 21. Uh, didn't have any treasure, <laughs> so I gave my time. But you can always give back, and I would encourage people listening to this for your own benefit, believe it or not, to start contributing to the world around you today. And it doesn't have to be with money either is the best part. And a lot of, right. a lot of great people have said, if you want to make money, you first have to give money. You know, it, because yeah. if, if you want something, you give it. If you want effort in a relationship out of the mm -hmm. other person, you have to give effort. You know, there, there's a lot of silver linings and similarities in that aspect of if you want you first have to give and a lot of people don't get that I think I agree and it, it it is important to be somewhat selfish at a young age so you can set yourself up to have a platform like navigate or find the success mm -hmm. that you have found but at the same time and like you said I, I love that you're doing it periodically throughout your entire career ever since mm -hmm. you were a kid mm -hmm. which a lot of people don't do I haven't done you know I I think I got first tied in as an early teenager mm -hmm. probably with philanthropic work, but I, I think that's the most important part of not only business but life too, is finding your own un unique way to give back for people with similar interests and help those mm -hmm. people, yeah. which I think is great that you're doing. Yeah, well thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the books I just uh, finished in the last like couple weeks here is called Give and Take by Adam Grant. He teaches uh, around a lot of these positive psychology comments in the Wharton School of Business at Penn. Um, he's got three books out there, but, but um, Give and Take is the title of the one again that I just uh, finished. And it cites a great deal of research showing that those who are true givers, there's takers and matchers, right? There's, there's just taking and never giving back. There's people who just match. You're like, I'll match you, but that's it, you know? People who are net givers actually uh, receive more. They lead happier, better lives. They reach greater heights. So um, if you have to trick yourself into being a giver by telling yourself that, you know, it's going to, you know, net benefit you in life, I'm sure it is. We've talked a little bit about happiness in life. I know not just business. The pathway to happiness uh, in everything I've read always leads back to sort of a, a constant reinvestment in awakening or growth, right? And, um, and there's no question that giving back is a part of that. Yeah, <laughs> so, definitely. So yeah, yeah, no question. And uh, it makes I'm, you feel good too. 
A lot of people don't of realize course. that until they actually do it. A lot of people can give away other people's money, time, mm -hmm. things, but mm -hmm. once you really do it for yourself, even it for a birthday, you know, the first yeah. time you're young and you buy your, uh, your first birthday gift for somebody else, it feels good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, yeah. You know, you don't have to feel bad that you look good or feel good do it giving a gift. There's really cool research that basically shows that's a, that's fair, I love that's worthy, <laughs> and you I want it. <laughs> yeah. I love how you have an equation for everything. Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, um... It's the way your brain ticks. Yeah. It's my job to be a scientific thinker, right? Like, you know, hypothesis, you know, is it falsifiable? It's you know, fascinating. Test versus I think control. it's awesome. Yeah. I, I do think it leads to, on average, wiser decisions, <laughs> right? If you're calculating everything. Yeah, how you assess right. things, how you assess the world around you. Right. Yeah. Do you think there's a way to calculate emotion within business? Yeah, in fact, that's a half of what our business does. Okay. And in fact, I would tell you in sports, in business, it's overwhelmingly emotions. They'll tell right. you this feature or the price, but it's really, one of the processes that I think you probably went through with Frank as well is public and private fears. And sure, I, yes, yeah. that was a big part of it. Yeah, and, and hopefully you talked about that with Frank in front of this audience. Okay, good, so I won't repeat it, but um, people do things because of how they'll feel and then they rationalize it with the facts and figures. You didn't buy that cool bicycle, shirt, car, whatever it is that you did um, because the economics made sense. You right. Didn't. You just kind of rationalize that after, but you did it to feel important, significant, alive, meaningful, you know, cool. To <laughs> other people. Yeah. A really cool exercise that I've never heard of anybody doing, and I'm sure there's plenty of stuff like it out there, but that I've always reminded myself of is if I'm the only person on this earth what am I going to want? What am I going to need? What am I yeah, going to do? Yeah, I love that one. And, and what it's kind like of house when, would you live in? When nobody else is watching. Yeah. What, what truly makes me happy? What do I truly enjoy that doesn't necessarily bank on the opinion of others? You yeah. know, a lot of people will be like, oh, well, you know, say for example, a car. You just, mm -hmm. you, anybody, anybody just drives that car so they look good. Yeah. Well, a lot of people are fascinated by the mechanics and, you know, the paint and the maintenance. A yeah. lot of people, that's a hobby. Yeah, yeah, there are people who definitely, the features matter. Right, and a lot of people love architecture. They love building something. They mm -hmm. love, you know, beauty and whatnot. So I, I think it's finding the right set of things that you're passionate about, not because of what other people think, but because of what you love, which a lot of people don't do. Yeah, yeah. And there are a lot of things to compare in that little microscope, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd say everybody probably has three to five things that they truly do and love because they're passionate about. You know, some people might love doing their makeup because that's fun for them, not because of what they care what they look like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, like you're an artist. Yes, I would right, say right. it would be a beautiful thing if it was like a form of art to you. Unfortunately, the makeup thing is one of the things I worry about. You're literally wearing a mask. There's a lot of stuff that talks about the masks we wear to appear who we want to be or who we right. think other people want us to be. When you wear a lot of makeup, you're actually literally wearing a mask. <laughs> you are not you. You are. Anyway, I get it though. There's pressure, especially in a place like Scottsdale, Arizona. There is pressure to look a certain way. Thank God I live in Phoenix, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Look at you, that border, yeah. all the difference in the world. Right, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I totally agree, and it's sad. It's really sad. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that, you talked about parenting, and um, for me, I think the biggest thing any parent can do is believe in their kid. I agree. If they can just believe in their kid, then not a lot, not a lot else matters. I agree, I agree. Unconditional love, essentially. Right. You ever heard those people when they're winning, like, you know, the whatever, an Academy Award, and you know that if your child wants to go into comedy or acting, that it's super, the starving artist. Your expectation is they will fail. <laughs> right. But they still support them because they love them and they support their passions. Right. As opposed to saying you're supposed to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> That's safe, secure, and you'll make a lot of money being a doctor or a lawyer. Right. Yeah. So when I was in eighth grade, um, I got gifted a bit of a beat down golf cart as a joke because yeah. family had one and I said, well, I want my own. I can't drive yet. I couldn't drive any of the cars. I'm very passionate about cars and vehicles. I think it's yeah. fun. Um, but getting to the point, eventually that turned into a business where I would be working on up to 10 golf carts at a time. Oh, and no way. Instead of my dad saying, you know, oh, you're kind of blocking the garage and driveway. And was whatnot. that your first entrepreneurial endeavor, first business by the way? was actually seventh grade, I think. Um, yeah. But instead of doing any of that, he built me a shop in the backyard, which ultimately became Phoenix Golf Carts HQ. Awesome. Yeah, so that That's was really so cool. cool. And unfortunately, you can't buy them anymore. You know, I, I kind of bought out the crappy Craigslist market. There's uh, yeah. 
not much else you can flip a profit on anymore. But for me, like you said, with passion, I didn't do it because I wanted to make money. There, there are a lot more easy ways to make money if you want to flip a dollar. But I loved cars at the time. I couldn't drive one. So I got a golf cart and I was like, hey, this is kind of fun. You can drive around with it with your friends. You know, you can treat it like a car with where I live, go places. And I was like, well, I kind of want, you know, another one. And then I realized, I'm like, instead of treating this as, you know, a materialistic hobby, why don't I do something cool out of it? And then that's when I had the mindset of, okay, let's create this into a business. Which, by the way, I say business. It was not a business. I was making all these purchases and selling in cash over Craigslist. But, yeah. you know, technically no, speaking, it's a, business. It, it, it's a barbarian mm -hmm. business, you know, bef yeah. before taxation and all that entered the country. But um, it was fun. And I didn't, you know, I, I would do it if I wasn't even making money because I got to touch and feel and work with um, and build what I thought was art to me, you know. So I, I think that's cool. And like you said, you do it without even realizing it. You make money without realizing it because yeah. you do what you love. And people can tell when you're passionate about what you love. And yeah. they look for a leader to believe in. Mm, I love that your dad did that for you. He, what he was doing is teaching you how to fish as opposed to right. giving you one. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? That's yeah. pretty cool. That was really cool. Very what cool a experience. You were how old when you did that? Um, when you started it? Well, yeah. So I got it in seventh grade. So, God, I don't know. Maybe like 14-ish. Maybe. Cool. I think 14, 15 maybe. I was 14 yeah. when I got my first contract. Uh, it was like doing landscaping for the softball fields in my hometown. Okay. Where like I got the contract. So still I was just a laborer, but instead of being hired by someone else, I got the contract myself to service it and hire others or whatever was necessary to get it done. Such a priceless lesson. You know, all the risk reward that comes with that. So right. good for you. Yeah. I think every young kid should have an experience like that. Oh, you know, yeah. You, you see, it, no matter what it is, and I mean, I'm talking small. This was not big by any means. I think mm -hmm. in total, I flipped probably under 30 golf carts, which is good. You know, yeah. it was a lot for the time, you know, balancing right. middle school, which at the time was my entire world. But, um, yeah, I, I think having an idea and teaching your kid to transform an idea into a business is what's great. And, you know, how you can do that, why you should do it, if you should do it. Um, like you said, having the calculated risk. Yeah, yeah, even at a young age is a good exercise. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Very yeah. cool. Very yeah. cool. Do you think your listeners are future entrepreneurs? Do you think that's what drives them to your podcast? Um, I think it's a little bit of everything. Um, statistically, um, mm -hmm. speaking your lingo, statistically speaking, only 1% are. And not everybody of is meant to be a leader. Yeah, yeah. And society would crumble if everybody was a leader <laughs> and everybody owned a business and everybody had equity everywhere. That's mm -hmm. just not how capitalism and the economy mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. You have to have people like the doctors and the lawyers and the teachers um, and everybody else involved mm -hmm. to make society function. And it's not bad by any means to not be a leader and not own an asset and not being under employment or not employing Americans and rather being under employment because society needs that. And entrepreneurs need that. Entrepreneurs need to hire people like that. Mm -hmm. And my opinion is that no matter what you do in life, whether you're selling golf carts or mowing a softball field, as long as you're happy and content and love the people in your life, there's nothing wrong with that. So I think probably a lot of people listening are never going to get to the point of creating their own asset, not because they don't want to or they don't have the ability to, but just because that's, statistically speaking, what is correct. Um, I'm not saying that's true. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that will do similar stuff to what you've done mm -hmm. in the sense of creating something that they love. Um, however, I also think that there's a lot of people out there that already found something that they love, whether it's a career in marine biology or opening up their own clinic or private practice, and mm -hmm. that's what they love. And if you love what you do, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much is in the bank, you're successful. And if you love the people in your life, I think that's all that really matters. I like that. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Like we need that. those people. <laughs> you know. And well, they, they yeah. need us, too. Everybody needs each other. Well, certain personality types just aren't um, comfortable with the risk, right? Or the variability in the day-to-day -day tasks or having well, the they, they might not skill want sets, it. right? It's not only yeah. that they're not comfortable, but they just might not be drawn to it. All the more reason for my hope that people who listen to this do some assessments, some objective ways in which you learn about yourself so you know what you are more likely meant to do. <laughs> A lot of people say they're going to find themselves later on in life, which I think mm -hmm. is 
they're fooling themselves. You yeah. know? If you don't get out there, like I said, the biggest tool is experience. I, I think I lost, well, I, I lost money on the first one that I initially sold back to buy another one, golf cart, before mm -hmm. I realized I wanted to make it into a business. And I was like, oh, to hell with it. I'll just buy the one that I wanted anyways. So I bought that one off Craigslist. It was used and worn down, but I fixed that one up. And by the way, my handyman was the one that um, gave me all the rusted over tools and taught me how to do everything. So he was awesome. He was great. That's cool. And uh, then sold that one again, lost money. And then I bought my third one. And the third one was the first golf cart that I ever flipped a profit on. And I was like, mm -hmm. so this is how you do it. Or, you know, yeah. kind of. And, and half of it was kind of luck. But you learn through doing, through luck, through being in the wrong place at the wrong time and also the right place at the right time. Yeah. yeah. Um, Failure is an amazing teacher, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also it's fun, you know, because you, you learn that way and then you can perform a lot better, a lot quicker. I agree. Through failure. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that was cool. That's cool you did that. Yeah. And there are a lot of different simulations that kids can do. You know, they're... Um, like entrepreneur simulations? Right, right. Well, and, and also just kind of pretending, you know, mm -hmm. what would happen if XYZ um, were to fold out. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest issue is motivation. A lot of kids and even adults out there aren't motivated enough to pave their own path. Mm. Maybe yeah. they have more important things in their life. And not everybody can. You know, I, I like to say that, you know, Saying you don't have time is just a lie, but some people really might not have time. And you know it's unfortunate, but um, some yeah. people are given a pretty poor path in life to lead up to. But um, oh I, yeah. I think that creates grit like no other. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it is a privilege to have that chance. I don't think people understand how lucky you are just to be born in this country. Uh, you know, it's a lost art to really be patriotic, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. Yeah, um, it is. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I know. I think travel solves that real quick. The perspective on what alternative paths are on this planet right I now, agree. in this time, <laughs> and where you could be. Yeah, we have a rule of law and an unbelievable military that makes us uh, sort of independent and in our own control. And if anything, we're the problem for others. <laughs> but some people are worried about their own home. Well, let's hope we can keep it that way. <laughs> you know, yeah. Historically speaking, empires only last 250 years. I suspect that, um, yeah, that's a good one, yeah. I, I, I suspect borders come down before we face that kind of world again, but who knows? We are in an interesting time, right? <laughs> and the We're at a crossroads. The, the paradox in, in it all is if socialism is so great and so many people hate the founding fathers that formed this country, then why don't you go to Cuba? <laughs> why don't you leave this country and go somewhere where it is a socialist country? And they don't. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, if socialism worked, I'd be all for it. If the human mind did not feel the need to create and employ and be successful and find fulfillment, and that wasn't part of our you know, ego, day-to-day -day life mm. mentality, and everybody could live in a utopia, that would be great. Honestly, mm. in my opinion, it sounds pretty boring. But if it worked, <laughs> that'd be great. You know, I'd be all for it. Right. But... The fact is that socialism time after time after time has failed. And I think mm -hmm. that a lot of people, especially like you were talking about Gen Z and the main viewers of this podcast, don't realize that in order to understand, engage current and future politics, business, economy, anything, you first have to understand the past. And how many kids do you think pick up a history book for fun? Probably none. Yeah. And those are the people that 10 years ago are now adults. And like this generation will soon be adults, it's up the chain and mm. it's becoming less and less popular to understand the past. I worry about it a little bit. There's some really inspiring things about millennials and Gen Z, you know, their freedom and creativity and, you know, their belief of like, you know, you know, as opposed to material things, it's experiences and stuff, very cause and philanthropic oriented. So there's some really beautiful things about it. But generally speaking, I do worry. Um, yeah, it's a little worrisome. We'll see. We will. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. We've been on a pretty good path, right? This country, this world, things are getting better. I think there's a belief that things are perpetually getting worse and that, you know, death and crime and all these things are up, um, but they're actually down. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's people like you to thank for it that, you know, <laughs> you're, know you're giving so. people the ability to do what they love. Oh, well, thank you. I, I do, I do enjoy what I do, and I do feel really fortunate that I get to work with amazing people, and I do feel really fortunate that 
they like what they do. They get to come to work on something they're passionate about. It, it's much more fulfilling than just working, say, to make money. So if you guys have any interest to further research AJ, you'll find that Forbes said that his company oh. <laughs> was uh, one of the top 10 places to work in the sports marketing industry. Yeah, and yeah. I think the quote that uh, your clients say that they work for each other and not the, not the money, not the business, yeah. not the equity, they work for each other, which I think is great that you formed such a team-like um, you know, mm. stratosphere in your business. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'm really proud of that. Uh, there's a tendency in sports to treat people pretty poorly because people want to work in it so badly, so you can take advantage of that surplus of labor. I'm really proud that we do everything we can to treat people well, and the results are that you know they work hard for you, and they do good work, they stay, so, yeah, I've got a pretty good thing going on, and man, do I feel lucky. <laughs> yeah, you are. Well, you have, you have yourself to thank. You, yeah. know, you, you built it, you created it, and um, you're running it. Well, thank you. If there's some super motivated, super talented person who's really passionate about the business of sports, uh, we're looking for you, too. We, we have no age limits. All uh, of you out there. Yeah. Well, we had, a, we had a Gen Z expert that was on a four-year contract, under contract with us for four years. We found her from her junior high science project that was related to apparel and perception of apparel in her generation. She's now, you know, uh, finishing at Princeton. Uh, she hasn't worked for us the last two years, but uh, yeah, I guess that took her from age 16 to 20. She worked with us. We don't have those uh, boundaries of someone can't be a certain age. In fact, she was our first Gen Z expert. So adults, professionals in our world would actually do the market research on Gen Z, but she would act as a curator to that, to translate that to other generations from the voice of her own generation. Um, and she's about as old as you can be and be Gen Z. So, yeah, someone super passionate about sports business, reach out, navigate. You can find us on LinkedIn. My email is published on our website, which is nvgt.com. Always looking for awesome talent. So thank you for mentioning that because it matters. Of course. <laughs> I think it's great that you threw credentials out the window when you started it. You know, there, <laughs> yeah. there are a lot of talented people out there with a lot of passion. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Right. And for those of you that don't know, AJ actually has a podcast of his own, Navigating Sports Business, so feel free to check that out. What platforms can they find it on? You can find it anywhere you can find a podcast, you know, it's, it's an, and on our website. Uh, but uh, yeah, do listen in. If you believe in learning from others, which you obviously do, because, you know, if they're listening to this, they've taken the time to listen to the two of us. We have some pretty amazing people on there, you know, commissioners and team owners, Kim Pagula, the Buffalo Bills, we've had the great CEOs of teams, the CEO of the Seattle Kraken I mentioned, you know, who we're working with. So these aren't just average people in sports business. They're, they're people at the absolute top doing really amazing things. So yeah, if you like learning, check out Navigating Sports Business. Thank right. you for mentioning that. And we're going to include that in the description. Cool. All right. Well, great. AJ, thank you so much yeah, for coming thank on. thank you. Great really talking to you. Loved our conversation. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you so much. I look forward to our paths crossing again soon. Sounds good. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, you guys did great. AJ, you Good. were fantastic. Thank you. Yeah.